Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. Today we have last lecture of this whole course. In this MOOC course you have been introduced to the concepts of genomics, proteomics and proteogenomics. An effort has been made to help you understand various steps of data generation, analysis and interpretation. Though the field of proteogenomics is still evolving, its contribution to the development of science particularly in precision medicine cannot be undermined. There are many tools which are currently being used for proteogenomics. I hope you got a good understanding of these tools and publicly available resources which you can also start using for your own research. The National Cancer Institute USA has constantly made an effort to bring research communities together for fighting the common evil of dreadful disease like cancer. In this last lecture, you will be introduced to the various initiatives of NCI toward development of a cancer free world. This lecture is essentially a brainstorming meet of cancer clinicians, researchers and industry experts which we conducted to mark Cancer Moonshot India program at IIT Bombay. So, let us have this interactive session about Cancer Moonshot India and a perspective shared by Dr. Henry Rodriguez. First of all, it is a great honor to be here. I mean, I know about a year and a half ago when I ran into Sanjeev and, and Sanjeev had talked about the program that he was developing here in India. But one of the things I ended up doing was contacting a lot of my colleagues that knew his work. And the one thing that they did indicate is that the work that's being produced in his laboratory is exceptionally well. So it's just an honor to now to be here knowing that India has joined this international effort that is one of the outshoots of the United States government. So what I thought that I would do is to sort of give a simplistic overview on how we ended up doing what we do now within the National Cancer Institute. More specifically, two years ago, how the cancer group shot actually got established. So let, let me give my little history here from a simplistic level. People don't know why the National Cancer Institute enjoys these large scale programs. So I actually don't come from a proteomics background. People who know me, you can look it up. I actually come from a genomics background and I'm classically trained in California in drug development. So one of the things that did attract me to the National Cancer Institute when they recruited me was their history. And the history you need to understand when genomics fits with proteomics. So if people talk about genomics large scale and you mention the word National Cancer Institute, the one that everybody's going to recognize is the Cancer Genome Atlas. And that program actually got created in 2006 when it went public. That's the key, when the program went public. And the program in a 10 year window has done an incredible job from a cataloging based per, uh, perspective to develop these great resources that the public is able to use. In the span of 10 years, they went to about 35 different cancer types looking and they cataloged over 14,000 individuals. But the, but the part that a lot of people might not be familiar with is that when they launched the Cancer Genome Atlas or when they were trying to develop it, they did not simply want to go after the genes. The National Cancer Institute, when they were formulating this program, they wanted to go after proteins. And at the very same time that we launched the TCGA program, based on the genomics landscape, we went after proteins. And that program is one that affectionately is referred to as the CPTAP. Now the reason they wanted to go after proteins at the same time as genomics was for two basic reasons, which were talked in the various sessions that people now have been holding. One of them is you absolutely want to figure out the biology of cancer. I'm one of those individuals that I think biomarker discovery is very great, but unless you understand the underlying biology of the disease, it's very difficult to take a novel discovery that you find, which is an anecdotal observation, and making that discovery clinically actionable on a wide scale. That's very difficult and very rare to be quite honest. So understanding the biology is extremely important. The other reason that it's very important to understand the proteins, exactly what your therapeutics is going after, is the key word therapy. While immuno oncology is very promising, the vast majority of drugs that we still give to our patients, they're typically chemical based. And the chemicals, there's very few that target DNA, such as inter 
uh, uh, binding strands. The main variety of drugs will target a protein. So you really need to understand from a dose perspective what's the quality of these proteins and exactly the efficiency and the binding constant of the target you're trying to go after. Not an inference, which is typically commonly done. But here's now what happened. Before the cancer genome atlas got launched, we were starting to think about it in, in the early 2000s, and that's when the first draft of the human genome got created. That really led to this great interest on in looking at the molecular biology of cancer. But at the same time, there was a publication that got released looking at ovarian cancer early stage using an emerging technology at the time, which was mass spectrometry. They made a claim that they're able to use proteomics without even recognizing what the protein is, simply recognizing a pattern of an instrument and using that as a predictor for early stage of ovarian cancer. Very promising, it raised a lot of interest with a lot of cancer directors back in the US. Unfortunately, it was found that the, that the study, the way it was designed, the way that things were interpreted were not correct. So the reason what, they, what we ended up doing at the end sale was quite interesting. When it came to CPTAC, we did not go after biology in 2006. Unlike the genomics landscape, they felt at the time the technology was quite mature and you could trust the data. So CPTAC first had to show that you could take these emerging technologies and do your best to try to understand the analytics. Standardize it where you can, and if you can't standardize it, try to harmonize the measurements in the analytical workflows. Once you're able to show that you could actually come back with measurements that's going to be representative of biology, not a measurement that's representative of an artifact, that the way you take a sample, the way you process a sample, the way you do your instruments, then the board will give us permission to go up to biology. So this is what we ended up doing, which is quite interesting because it's very rare that the National to Health develops a standards initiative. But we ended up doing that to bring proteomics to the state of genomics. So for the very first five years, CPTAC basically tried to go after the analytics of mass spectrometry. And we looked at two folds, which is actually discussed in the past two days. One, we looked at the discovery space. Here we basically showed, if you take a lot of people refer to a shotgun, I, quite frankly, am not a fan of the terminology shotgun, but I tend to basically refer to doing genomics. This is a deep dive, comprehensive measurement of trying to look at everything we can at the sample, exactly what we do in genomics. And in that space, we basically showed if you got standard operating procedures, we did elaborate ground model studies, we actually had eight laboratories throughout the US, then we did an international trial, and we showed you get very good concordance of your measurements across your laboratories. But the one that we really wanted to put our mark on is the one that exactly we do in genomics. Once you do a deep dive, then you develop gene panels. These gene panels is actually what drives our clinical trials today. So we wanted to develop that same space when it came to proteomics. Now it turns out this measurement technology, a lot of people refer to as today as multiple reaction monitoring. You have different uh, uh, ways of phrasing it, but this is not something that CPTAC ever developed by any stretch of the imagination. It's been used in clinical lab for over 30 years. You simply use it for the measurement of small molecules. What we wanted to show is what other, other laboratories were already using is could the measurement of targeted mass spec be applied to the measurement now of a peptide? And informatically sticks the information back up to the measurement of a protein. So what we ended up doing there, we basically looked at MRM, which was already being used in, in laboratories, but it's really due diligence on the accuracy and precision across multiple labs was yet not demonstrated. And it's very important to have that proof before you go back to a tumor board. So we basically, again, we developed a round robin studies. We have laboratories that distributed throughout the US. Then we did an international round robin study, and we showed that this is a very good quantitative reproducible, reproducible measurement tool. The other thing that we wanted to do at the time was explore the clinical space. If, if you find an interesting biology, and if the biology is best measured using these technologies, what would it take to get the technology approved by the regulatory agency? So what we ended up doing, one of the things that we did was quite nice is that in the US to get a diagnostic device, approved, such as an IEMIA, you need to get regulatory clearance. And those, and there's two types. The first one you can go after is what's referred to as a 510K. So we actually worked with the regulatory agency in the United States. We worked with the clinical chemistry community. But what we ended up doing was quite novel. Typically, manufacturers will submit 510K to the regulatory agency. 
and the regular, the, the, and then you have to be able to mark up the document, putting all their comments and concerns on what they just submitted. But typically when that goes back to a company, they'll never release it to the public. We decided we wanted to make that very transparent. So we worked with them, we put on a workshop, and we actually submitted an official filing with the regulatory agency using this type of measurement technique. But because we made up all the data, but we did not make up our analytical workflows, it allowed the FDA then to mark up the document, and then once we got the documents back, because we worked with the clinical chemistry community, we published all their markings up. So it's a great way of making very transparent exactly the type of questions you would get if you were to, if you were to submit your instrument with these measurement techniques to get them approved by the FDA. The other stuff we recognize is that a lot of the reagents were being commercially sold. We felt that the quality was not the level of standards that we wanted to see these within the research and ultimately within the clinical grade world. So we worked with various manufacturers to kind of elevate the standards when they sell these reagents to the public domain. The other one was we started going to meetings and people would always say, I have an assay, I have an assay. In fact, one meeting that I went to that I now say quite openly is that one person stood up and they said, I already got an assay that every human protein that's out there. I was quite surprised when I heard that. After the meeting, I basically approached this individual and said, explain to me how you developed an assay to every human protein. Well, it turns out what they were talking about was a theoretical-based assay, or an assay that's basically run in a buffer. In a clinic, that's not considered an assay in using that terminology. So what we decided to do within CPTAC, we basically then started to develop fit-for-purpose-based criteria that begins to define exactly what an assay is. What's nice now is that that has not been accepted by the international community, more specifically, one of the prominent journals of FCP now they've adopted those criteria within the journal itself. And this was also done with the pharmaceutical industry, with the clinical reference laboratories, and the regulatory agency, and the clinical uh, labs within the United States to develop these analytical uh, uh, sort of criteria. So this actually now represents five years' worth of history with the CP Tech based effort. Again, we had to go back and we had to show that the measurement you're able to obtain is basically trustworthy. You can actually believe in the measurement of being a representative of biology. Once we did that, we went back to our board, and then we got reissued. And what we decided to do was quite interesting, because obviously, at the NCI, we have the Cancer Genome Atlas. That, that now has five years' worth of history above CB type. And they're generating a lot of interesting information. And what our, our proposal to them was, we want to take the exact tumor that just got genomically sequenced within the Cancer Genome Atlas program. And at the same time then, we would actually now go after the proteins within that sample. And we would believe that if you were to layer a comprehensive protein measurement above a comprehensive genomics measurement, you're able to obtain additional biology that is either difficult to obtain or simply not feasible through genomics itself. Now think about that, because at the end of the day, and I saw it today, a lot of people said, well, proteomics, that's always much better than genomics. The reality is, by the time you move into a clinic, two things is going to drive your decision. And that is, is the test clinically relevant for the disease you're trying to go after? And the other one they're going to ask is, well, how much is the test and what's your throughput? Because the reality is, if, if transcriptomics is able to predict the same thing proteomics can, somebody at the hospital is going to say, well, why do, why do I need to measure in my protein? because it's lower throughput and it's a higher cost. So that was the gamble that we took. Could we find additional biology? So in the next five years, we decided to go after three cancer types of the cancer genome atlas. We went after breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and colorectal cancer. I'm not, I'm, I am not gonna go through all the details, but suffice to say, in each one of these cancer types, we were able to identify additional biology that was missed simply because you can't obtain it from genomics itself, or it's just a better way of integrating the data set between you, at least within the genomics and within the proteomics landscape. Furthermore, what we learned from this lesson was that if you simply go after one type of an omic, whether it be genomics or transcriptomics or proteomics, most likely you're gonna be missing key biology that could be inferred from one of those other omics. So integrating those worlds would become very important for our program. So with that in mind, 
I, I heard that question today, so I quickly then put this next slide out. One of the things that I started to be, that people were asking me, in fact, before I ended up going back to my board to come up with the next version of CP tag, was the exact question that somebody just asked at today's conference. And that is, well, you ended up doing proteomics and you threw it above genomics, and you guys found all this additional biology. Why don't you just do proteomics then? Because it's much better. Well, my philosophy has been, should you do genomics and proteomics and which one's better? I would argue no one really knows the answer yet. And here's why. I'll break it down into two components for you. One, let's look at biology itself, because that's the part that I tend to love the most. If you look at the Cancer Genome Atlas, because the TCJ, what they did for 10 years, it really wasn't clinically actual, uh, actually deployable yet. They're basically trying to figure out biology, because those samples were not collected with a, with a clinical question yet in mind. It was basically cataloging uh, samples. TCGA, as I said, in, in a 10-year window, they went after 34 cancer types, and they basically genomically characterized over 14,000 individuals. In the process, they basically identified all these actual mutations, where now we have small molecules, and all these small molecules are driving a lot of our precision on on oncology trials. So that's the good news. Now you can look at the other side of the story, which is what we're learning about three to four years now into this sort of science and driving our, our clinical trial. More and more, we're learning that a lot of these individuals, that we identified all these actionable mutations, a lot of them really are not responding that well to the treatment that they're being administered within our treatment arms of whatever clinical trial that they're being put under. Furthermore, if they do respond, we're finding out that those responses are actually short-term lived. And that even excludes the toxicity that could occur. That once you get that, you have to put them on another arm within that trial itself. So the question becomes, why? We don't know. But what we do know with absolute certainty is that there's still a tremendous amount of biology that's missing from that picture. Now, that, now this is the biological version. Let's flip it to a clinical way of thinking. A great little paper came out about three years ago. And this is by Tito Bobo, who used to be at the Cancer Institute, and now I moved to New York City. So Tito, what he ended up doing was quite interesting. He basically said, let me actually go to the regulatory agency back in the United States and ask the question about over a 12-year window when people start using the term precision medicine, precision oncology. The reality is you're talking targeted therapy. And if you look at all the targeted therapy drugs that have now been approved by the FDA, there's, just, there's, there's about over seven now. And your window spans about 12 to 15 years. And what he ended up doing was he took two common criteria that's used all the time in our trials. And that is when you look at the individuals, you ask, well, what's going to be their overall survival? And at the same time, what's the progression-free survival of these individuals? He excluded the exceptional responders, which is what a lot of people love to go after. And again, to be very fair, this is solid tumor typically mid-stage. And what he found out was, for all those drugs now that, that have been approved from a targeted perspective, on average, those two criteriums, it's less than three months. So that, that's really not that good. Again, it's very promising in oncology, but it's still, we could do a lot better. So using these two criteria, the argument of missing biology, and then the argument of, can you begin to play in the sandbox of clinical trials? That influenced directly the next iteration of the CPTAC program. So this is actually CPTAC. So this is actually CPTAC today. Again, these are five-year programs, and the next iteration, who knows what that will be, but that's what, that will that be contingent on the science that comes out of these programs. So we still have a biological model. That's exactly what we did within the next component. We're being held responsible to go after at least five more cancer types, hopefully more, but at the minimum, we have to go after five. Every sample that we get from our patients, these are all treatment IA samples, every sample goes and we partner directly with the Cancer Genome Atlas. They will do comprehensive genomic characterization. Then the sample of pieces that also goes to our characterization centers, along with our data analysis centers. At the same time that we run a biological arm, we have now an official translation arm. For the very first time, the Cancer Institute is now partnered in an ongoing proteomic laboratory with an NCI-sponsored clinical trial. We have three types of cancer types that we're going after, after 
for that component that involves a series of drug trials. But again, the part that I think that's quite nice about CPTAC is that the data we got born to about 12 years ago now, everything that we produce, we put it in the public domain, which is listed on the bottom of the slide. Everything from genomic information, proteomic information, any reagent that we develop, which are typically antibodies, any of the assays, all the SOPs that we produce our assays against, all that is placed in the public domain. The argument is, is that we know it's heavily being used by the community, and we believe by giving it back to the people, it drives the science, and hopefully patient care, you're able to accelerate it. Not just within your country, but across the globe. Because that's our goal ultimately. So, once this program got launched, here's something now, so here's now what started to happen within the Cancer Institute. So CPTAC, while it was one of the first ones that started to mix these two worlds together from a programmatic official level, it's not the only one that started to do that now. There's two other ones that, that recently got launched just over two years ago because of the Cancer Moonshot. One of them is referred to as the Apollo Program, and the other one now is referred to as ICPC, which is the International Cancer Reporting Genome Consortium. So, very simplistically, the Apollo Program is one. So, these programs actually got started as, as follows. I think a lot of us, and especially myself, I was extremely moved in early 2006 by the inspirational call of, of, of the former Vice President of our country, Joe Biden, when he actually launched the Cancer Moonshot. Now, you could go through all the details of what the Cancer Moonshot is, but the part that I enjoyed the most was I tried to simplify it into three simple objectives that we want to achieve from that. One of them happens to be we want to accelerate the progress in cancer research. There's many ways that you could do that. You could do technology development and other components. But the other two were the ones that I've always had my heart in, which is what CPTAC has been doing for the past 10 years. One is, you wanted to see greater cooperation and collaboration. And to be very clear, the way that this was phrased, it was not within your own university. It was not within your own country. They are hoping trying to explore international level collaborations. And the third one is the one that I was very happy with. They wanted to see a lot more sharing of your data. The reality, you can look at the genomics landscape, a lot of the information that you're developing is pretty much pre-competitive. Because they're basically observations, and a lot of those observations typically does not have yet a clinical relevance behind them. So releasing the data is not detrimental. In fact, it's actually beneficial because other individuals are able to take your data sets. You get recognized for it, but again, you're able to drive science a lot further. So using that as a backdrop, the very first one that we wanted to pilot, taking the CPTAC model and trying to bring other organizations into it, became one that involved the, the U.S. federal government, specifically three of our agencies. And that program now is referred to as Apollo. So Apollo is one right across my hospital, happens to be one of the largest hospitals from the Department of Defense, which is the birth of cancer center. In fact, that's the one that you see a lot of the presidential helicopters that Congress and all the representatives get treated at. But that said, though, we basically walked across our street, we met the cancer center director, it was a great conversation. What we recognized was, was there was an opportunity to begin to pair up the National Cancer Institute, the Department of Defense, and the Veterans Administration. And the idea was very simple. They would begin to adopt a lot of the metrics, a lot of the standards developed by CPTAC, and they would also begin to implement this sort of proteogenomic-based approach to look at the science of their veterans and of their family members. And the part that's quite nice, again, is that we signed this partnership based on predominantly one main criteria, is that all the data that they would produce would be placed in the public domain. So, that's what that involves the U.S. federal government. Then the next thing I find out, when I'm called by the White House, by representatives of the Cancer Moonshot Program, they said, so we, we kind of like what you ended up doing from this federal government uh, perspective. Is there an opportunity to basically make this on an international level? I started to think about it, and the idea was quite appealing, I have to admit. So this is what we ended up doing. So we started to ask myself the following. What if you could actually take this proteogenomic model and begin to scale it on an international level. If you were to do that, 
Then you would have each country, which is the best in making these decisions along with their various representative government, they would be in the best position to determine what cancer type would be of most significance to their own nation. Furthermore, they would adopt a lot of the metrics and standards, if applicable, developed by the U.S. Safety Type Program. But again, the part that becomes very critical for me happens is that of any data that you produce from any of these official partnerships, regardless of where you're from, what country, we want to see the data be placed in the public domain. You can host it in your country, or at the same time, the United States, the Cancer Institute, we would host those data sets for you. That becomes a key criteria when we sign our partnerships. So, that said, here's now what transpires. So, in early 2016, in mid-summer, so in January, the Cancer Moonshot gets launched, then we quickly launched Apollo, and then I get this call, we would like to see this scale on an international level. The very first country that signs on in July is one. So, at that point, we bring in Australia. So we have four institutions now within Australia that form this first partnership. I thought my job was done. I could give myself one of these nice pats on the back. I got one. I'm down at the White House. I basically go home. I tell my daughter, oh, look at the great stuff I'm doing. Next thing I get another phone call a week later. We loved what you did. Is there an opportunity to expand this? And by the way, we want to see it expanded in eight weeks. Now I had no idea why eight weeks was important. It turned out the reason it was, I found out later on, because something was happening in New York City at the United Nations, but they wouldn't tell it to me at the time. But I felt that that would be something very interesting to go after. After all, it's very rare that you ever get to work for leaders within your own country, so I thought it would be interesting. So we did. So in the span of eight weeks, we went from one country to four institutions. At this point, now, we've, now we're spanning eight countries and now it's involving 16 institutions. <clears throat> Pretty impressive, but it's amazing when you send an email and it says, on behalf of the vice president of our country, this is something that we would love to see happen. It's amazing, because my name doesn't carry much weight. Other people's names do. Now, this is September of 2016. Keep that in mind. Right now, we're pretty much at the end of 2018. So the question is, whatever happened to this program? So this program actually has taken a beautiful life on its own. Today now, this program has an official name. It's not referred to as ICPC. This program now involves 12 countries. It spans 31 institutions. Collectively, they're going after 13 cancer types. They're not all different cancer types. Some do overlap, but that's fine. Because the dream, the vision that I've always had for this is that ultimately, while the US produced their database, to me, ultimately, to understand cancer, you really want to make it representative of the diversity of individuals and of the diversity of their cancer itself. It's that culmination, I think, that you're able to better understand the disease on a, on a global scale. So, what has the program done the past 12 months? So, here you go. So, in the last 12 months alone, these are some of the activities that the program achieved. The very first data set that we released to the public actually comes out of Taiwan. It was a cool little study that we did on oral cancer because of the pino that they happened to chew. That got put in the public domain. We also welcomed, at that point, two other, uh, or three institutions spanning two countries. Early in the calendar year, we brought in Korea University. And of course, as, as Sanjeeva mentioned, the other country that we brought in board was India in May of, of uh, 2018. We also held a series of local cancer moonshot roundtable sessions basically raising awareness within each country and within their governments that helps them raise money to do the research that's very critical to do, which is one of the good things that we're doing here today, and I think we should be having a lot more of these to raise more awareness and the funding. The other thing that we ended up doing is we actually launched a training program of students. We piloted that with, uh, at this point, Australia with Macquarie University. And the other thing that we're starting to do, which is quite nice, is that we're starting to take some of our laboratories and we're starting to convert them to become CLIA certified so they can take the actual test when they develop a targeted-based assay and take it directly back to their tumor forms and potentially begin to further fuse together the genomic panels along with proteomic panels in influencing how best to actually treat the individual itself. 
The last time we all got together, it was in uh, the United States, in Orlando, Florida. It just, just took place a couple of months ago. And as you can see, it's a great family event, I have to say, a big tradition now that we started. Each represented from each country. We all hold flags as a sense of pride. But again, it basically shows one thing that I've learned from this, is that two and a half years ago, when we thought about this idea, and then two years ago, when we actually launched it, everyone would say, you'll never get the data from place in the public domain. It's happening, we're starting to, to release it, and there's other cancer data sets that will release within the next six months once those manuscripts get accepted. There's really no barrier, which is what I'm learning. If you simply ask, and you actually are very cautious, and you're very clear on what you expect, things can happen. So, let me leave you with this final thought. So I think a lot of progress has been made when it comes to genomics, and I'm the first one to admit that, because I see how it definitely benefits patients. However, here's the reality of the, of the statistics today. Within the United States, on average, on a yearly basis, just shy of two million individuals will hear the words you never want to hear. And I tell everyone that's in a research lab, go spend or train in a cancer hospital because you really understand the impact of what patients go through when they're under treatment and the ones that cannot survive from the disease itself. They will hear the words that you've been diagnosed with cancer. Furthermore, on average within the United States, just over half a million individuals pass away from one of its many diseases. Because it's not just one disease, it's a series of diseases that defines cancer. But this is not an issue for the United States. This is why we developed ICPC, and I think it's great that we have India on board. This is a global issue. On a global basis itself, on average, on a yearly basis, over 14 million individuals are diagnosed with cancer. And these are the ones that we're able to report. Furthermore, just shy of eight, of eight and a half million individuals will die, from, again, from as many diseases. So while I think a lot of progress has been made, I think there's a tremendous amount of work where we still need to go forward with. And quite frankly, I think the work that people are doing here, the idea of combining what we've learned from genomics and fusing it now with the measurement of proteomics, and in the future, I think fusing it even with metabolomics, I think that's the key. When technologies become very mature, there's an opportunity to combine them. That's the opportunity to take because you're able to get more biology out of the disease itself. So with that, I want to say thank you very much. In today's overview session, you are provided the knowledge of the various programs run by National Cancer Institute in the United States. It was clear from Dr. Henry Rodriguez's lecture and discussion that genomics and proteomics are complementary and they are of course indispensable for the understanding of disease pathobiology. You were also introduced to the importance of generating high quality data and the various efforts the CPTAC undertook to make proteomics more reliable among the research community. The Cancer Moonshot program aims at collaborating with international labs to gather comprehensive protogenomic information of various cancers. India has recently joined this initiative and now we have become the 12th country to participate in ICPC or International Cancer Proteogenome Consortium to specifically look for breast, cervical and oral cancer. We are sure that you will be able to appreciate the importance of international collaborations, data sharing and proper quality controls if we are to understand the disease biology and find drug targets against cancer in the future. The field of proteogenomics is still emerging and every day new software and new tools are being used. It was not possible to cover all of them in this course. However, we hope that with this course we are able to lay a foundation and instill in you the enthusiasm needed to take proteogenomics research forward. Thank you and all the best.